Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Rotary Club of London meeting for August the 30th. And I will ask Kirk Patterson to introduce our speaker for today. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, our meeting for August the 30th. Our guest speaker today is Robert Zibble. Robert is from uh, London Health Sciences Center. He joined uh, London Health Science Center in 2007 as the first full-time clinical and organizational ethicist. His current role is Director of Ethics, Patient Experience, and Health Equity and the Indigenous Liaison at LHSC. He teaches at the Department of Family Medicine at Western University and is a research collaborator at Western Health Ethics Law and Policy Help Lab. Robert is a grad of the University of Western Ontario with a Bachelor of Science, and he also holds a Master of Science from UT in Bioethics slash Medical Ethics. So, this afternoon, we are honored he's going to present, as it shows on the screen, a presentation on healthcare ethics and the necessity of the patient family engagement. Walter, let's join me in welcoming Robert uh, to this afternoon's session. So, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak with you. Um, I, I have over the years had an opportunity to do a number of public speaking events uh, outside of the traditional healthcare audiences, and uh, they usually turn out to be uh, some of the uh, the more interesting conversations uh, that, that I ever end up having. And you know, in that vein, I'd really like to uh, encourage this to be as much of a dialogue as possible. Um, over the last year and a half of spending uh, in probably 90% of my time in front of a, a computer screen and camera. Uh, I've really come to uh, miss the, the in-person opportunities for dialogue, especially as somebody who teaches uh, ethics and philosophy. Um, it is really challenging uh, not to, to be engaged in what we should be engaged in, and that is some form of uh, vigorous debate. Uh, but in, in this case, we're going to make do as best we can, and uh, I will uh, happily take questions at any point along the line, uh, or, or uh, if there are people who wish to challenge any assertions, I'd love to hear what you have to say. So I'm going to start by just telling you a little bit about um, myself. Uh, I'm, I'm actually uh, from London, uh, born and raised, uh, left many years ago and vowed never to return, and of course, uh, I think most of you would probably be familiar with this story. Uh, I had a number of children involved in my life, and uh, all of a sudden, London looked like a really good place to settle. So uh, I'm back in London for the better part of 15 years now. And uh, from all of that time, I have described myself as uh, an ethicist. And that conjures up a, a whole bunch of uh, ideas for a number of people uh, in healthcare. There's more familiarity with what an ethicist is. Outside of healthcare, there's a lot of question about what an ethicist is. And uh, it, it's really helpful to, uh, to, to outline that on the academic side, you know, there's a whole variety of academics in the university environment who describe themselves as ethicists uh, simply because they like to engage in, in uh, ethical debate and dialogue in a variety of fields. But in an applied sense, uh, a healthcare ethicist has a very particular uh, type of training and is, is less interested in debate for the sake of debate and more interested in uh, how we actually get to some sort of resolution, uh, whether it be a clinical decision or a policy decision uh, on very practical matters, practical ethical matters in healthcare. Uh, the way I describe my role to my children is that people come to me uh, with problems they have after they have asked a colleague uh, they've asked their boss, they've asked a department head, they have asked a, a manager, a coordinator, they may have asked their professional practice leader, they've sought advice from their college, 
they've sought advice from risk management and perhaps they've sought advice from legal counsel. And after they've gone to all of those places and they still don't know what they're supposed to be doing, and that's generally the type of problem uh, that people would call me for. And in most of those cases, uh, the odds are that you know, they're, they're still even unsure not only what to do, but what type of problem they're dealing with. Uh, and that's because the, these types of problems are typically values-based problems. I'm going to give you uh, a, a handful of examples, and then I'm going to get back into the, the just the, the nuts and bolts of what these problems are like. But in, in the last year and a half, there are a whole host of COVID-related ethics problems, some of which you're certainly uh, thinking about and engaged in, uh, others perhaps not. And the, the most easy one that comes to mind uh, is this, this political question, uh, which is also an ethics question of, uh, ought we to implement vaccine uh, mandates, uh, vaccine passports, uh, uh, the whole bit around what do we require and who do we re require it of? I just came out of a meeting right prior to joining you today where I was having discussion with others about the potential need to require vaccination for visitors to the hospital, which is a whole separate beast. Please do not walk away saying I just came from a presentation and the hospital is in fact doing this. It was a conversation. A uh, great part of my job is that I get to uh, just in, engage in a lot of thought experiments, but we have to ask these questions before we determine what the policy is going to be. Other COVID ethics related problems. Uh, when we had to scale back on a lot of clinical activity, we had to ask the question, whose surgery gets canceled first, uh, whose surgery is prioritized when we start opening back up. Those questions were of uh, most urgent importance to a number of patients, but importantly, that was not just the clinical decision. It wasn't just an evidence-based decision. Values influenced the way you answer that question. And that's what makes it an ethical issue. Hard to believe, uh, given where we are today, that it was only about uh, seven months ago that we were vigorously debating who gets vaccinated first. And people were jumping all over each other to say, uh, I'm a more important clinician than the next, or I'm a more important member of the public than the next. I really have to be next in the queue to, be, to receive vaccination. Um, the question of who and how many people should be in hospitals, that's just the, the general question of, do, do you not allow visitors and family members at all? If, if you limit, who do you limit it to? That's a really rigorous ethical uh, dilemma that we had to deal with. And one that maybe didn't get to the level of, uh, of your awareness for uh, for a solid year, uh, right from the outset of the uh, pandemic, there was a working group at the province working on a question, an ethical question of what are we going to do if we run out of ventilators to ventilate patients who require uh, breathing support? How would we decide which patients receive access to our ICU beds and which patients would not receive access, even though we would know that those patients are likely to die without that access? So, uh, you know, all of those questions and problems I just raised, those are ethical problems. And uh, it, it, you require an appeal to values and not just facts and data to determine the, the right answer to them. Now, outside of COVID, there's a whole host of uh, ethics problems that we deal with. And I'll just raise a few really quickly just to get your mind thinking about some of the things that I engage in. Um, you know, imagine a patient who doesn't want their children to know that they are going to uh, pursue a medically assisted death. And that's, it's the type of problem I have dealt with before. Um, what about a, a children who don't want their, their parent, who is a patient, to know about a, a very bad diagnosis? And that patient may have some cognitive impairment, and so they're not their own decision maker per se, uh, but that certainly raises all sorts of ethics concerns. Um, or a husband who refuses consent for his incapable wife's pain medication for uh, any number of reasons. Those those problems uh, are ethics problems. And so that's the type of challenge that, that I'm talking about. 
And before we can solve an ethics problem, we really need to just understand the mechanics of how ethics problems are constructed and how you uh, deconstruct them. It was uh, a philosopher, David Hume, who, who outlined for us what is known as the is-ought problem. And that is also known as the, the fact of value distinction in philosophy. So the, the way the is-ought problem works is uh, it, there are a category of statements that can be fact-based statements. These are our is claims. The chair is white. Uh, it is sunny outside today. And then there are a whole other category of statements, which are ought statements. So um, Jim ought to pick up after himself if he, uh, if he drops garbage on the side of the, the road. Um, that is a value preposition. And, and the important thing about the is ought problem is that ought statements or value statements cannot be derived from the fact or is based statements. So we have to understand that facts and values are two totally different universes. And we're really interested when we're talking about ethics in the values universe. Um, and it kind of leaves facts behind, or at least it keeps them in an entirely different category. And that, that's really helpful and important for us to know uh, because it, you know, many people in healthcare would say, well, evidence-based medicine tells us what we're supposed to do. I mean, that, that's why we look to the clinicians. We say the, the, the physician is the expert. Uh, they should, and this is, you know, our, our, the, the perhaps um, more historical way of thinking, but, you know, doctor knows best comes from a very evidence-based framework uh, uh, set of values that doesn't acknowledge this fact-value distinction. And th what's really uh, interesting is that we've learned in the past few, past few years that while I can cognitively understand the distinction between facts and values, um, the values you hold actually influence your read of the facts. And so um, if, and, and we see this in politics all the time, you know, depending on what end of the political spectrum you are, two people might look at the same set of events occurring and infer different facts from the, the, the same scenario. And that makes that, you know, that realization makes solving ethics problems that much harder. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, membership ethics versus uh, objective eth ethics. So membership ethics, you before, know, sometimes... Uh, oh. Before you jump there, I, I, it, this, I think, I hope it relates to uh, the ethics and the value-based and the fact-based, but how does integrity and honesty factor into this spectrum? So, so in, integrity and, and honesty are, uh, they, they can be principles or values that, that one wishes to hold, but, but just as plausible, uh, you can have a moral theory that does not rely on integrity. Now, it, it would be very difficult for that theory to be self-sustaining, um, and this would take us down a whole uh, other talk. Uh, but, you know, the, uh, a Kantian, uh, uh, Immanuel Kant would say it, it is impossible to have uh, a theory that is constructed on one that doesn't maintain some sort of integrity and honesty. But I'm going to come to that, that dimension uh, a little bit tangentially in, in a, couple of, a couple of minutes. Um, I, I'm often hearing people uh, talk about the, the distinction between morals and ethics. And uh, it, it's not a perfect distinction, you know, the different philosophers use the language differently, but, but morals often refer to uh, an ethics of choice, an ethics of, of personality. So uh, it, it can be, you know, being an environmentalist might be a moral decision for me, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is the objectively ethical stance for every human on the planet to be uh, an environmentalist in the way that I might choose to be. And so there are all sorts of personal decisions which reflect morals. Uh, but when, when I talk about ethics, we aspire to something that's a, a little more objective. Now, it's interesting, I, I, in uh, preparing for uh, chatting with you, I, I did note that the Rotary Club had its, had its own code of ethics. And I don't know how, if, if this is something that you all spend uh, a lot of time uh, talking about or thinking about, but 
uh, the Rotary Club's code of ethics, uh, that the four-way test, that the questions of, is it truth? Is it fair? Uh, will it build goodwill? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? You know, that, that demonstrates the morality of the, of the Rotary Club. If you choose to participate, or if you choose to be a member of the Rotary Club, you are choosing to embrace uh, some principles or values. And likewise, in healthcare, we would hope that when you choose to enter a health profession, you're choosing to subscribe to some values. And I think everybody's familiar with, if you're a physician, you subscribe to the Hippocratic Oath, but healthcare has gotten a lot more complicated in the last few years. And uh, there are now in Ontario, 26 regulated colleges in Ontario for uh, you know, OTs, PTs, nurses, uh, physicians, and, and, and on and on and on. Uh, and all of those codes of ethics that each has don't necessarily align. So that, that creates one of our, our major problems. We also have colleges that aren't even regulated. So like the Canadian College of Healthcare Leaders uh, has a code of ethics, which most leaders in healthcare subscribe to. And then a, a compounding issue is the multiple hats problem. So when uh, in healthcare, I may be a nurse, I may be uh, an executive and, and I, I do multiple things, but it's difficult for me to figure out when I'm supposed to abide by one code of ethics or another. Um, there, there are in, in ethics uh, a handful of domains that we consider when we're, uh, when we're doing research or study. There, there's clinical ethics decisions, and I'm going to set that aside because I think most of you would be comfortable in understanding the important role of engaging patients and patient families and partners in clinical ethics. So this is care about you as, a, as an individual. There are research ethics problems, uh, but there's a whole category of ethics problems in healthcare that are termed organizational ethics problems. And these are problems of policy, strategy, uh, decisions in which the ethical agent would be considered the corporation, not just one individual acting on behalf of the corporation. So in organizational ethics, uh, it is imperative that uh, patient and family engagement is a key part of it because, um, uh, oh, actually, I maybe you want to say something about what patient and family engagement looks like at LHSC, uh, something that, that, that Kirk is intimately in, involved in. Um, as a just base layer of understanding, patient and family engagement, what it means is really patients and family members, uh, other informal caregivers, actively collaborating to improve the system of healthcare in Ontario. So not just the individual clinical decisions, of course, as an as a individual patient, we have to engage patients and families. But more broadly, when we think about improving the system of care, we need the perspective of patients and families. And at LHSC, we do that uh, by having more than 100 what we term patient partners or, or uh, patient and family partners who have prior experience in the healthcare system as either as a patient or as a family member of a patient. But then we bring them into the hospital and there is some training, some onboarding to help them learn how to provide guidance to the hospital as a partner. And one of the, the biggest pieces about this is recognizing that you don't come into the hospital as a patient partner, uh, as an advocate. So if, if I'm a patient who, uh, you know, had my, my child had a, a particular cancer and I'm now a crusader for pediatric cancer, um, I don't partner with the hospital to be an activist, to ask the hospital to invest more in pediatric cancer research. That's not what patient partnership is about. Uh, patient partnership is about taking the wisdom of a collection of people who have had experience as patients or family members in the hospital and using that collection of wisdom to provide a different perspective than the hospital would normally necessarily have in any number of activities. And so uh, it, this plays itself out through either department level councils in which a variety of patient and family partners sit um, there are a number of hospital committees and board committees in which Kirk and others uh, sit routinely, 
Uh, and then we will have a variety of working groups where uh, an active policy problem is being considered. And uh, I'll come back to this COVID problem, determining what we do around our patient partner in a different sense, our visitor policy during COVID. Well, it's great for me to sit in an office and say, this is what I think makes sense. But if I don't have the voices of a number of people who are active patients or family members of patients, I may be missing uh, the boat in a whole bunch of regards. And over the past year and a half, we've needed to make no less than seven or eight major modifications to our visitor policy. And every time we did that, we had patient partners uh, at the table uh, helping us along. Now, all organizational ethics problems uh, suffer from a, a particular policy paradox, a known, well-known policy paradox, in that decisions will be rightly viewed as ethical or unethical, depending on the stakeholder's perspective. So uh, if I'm the physician, I might say that's ethical. If I'm the family member, I might say it's unethical. Uh, and that's the very simplistic. There are, you know, potentially hundreds of different stakeholder positions uh, and far too many for the values of each of those stakeholders to align perfectly. And so uh, unlike clinical ethics, where we might say rightly that it's the patient's values that are preeminent in determining the ethics of what we do for that patient, for organizational ethics, we need a different approach. In organizational ethics, we accept that the outcome, the ethics of the, the, the product of a policy or a policy decision are never going to be able to satisfy the variety of stakeholders who rightly have a vested interest in that decision. For some people, it's gonna be fair and for some people it's gonna be unfair. And so what we shift is in our mindset, we shift from fair outcomes to fair process. And the ethics of organizational decision-making <clears throat> in which patient partners are such a fundamental piece is a, a, a fair process approach that relies on five conditions. Uh, the first condition is that decisions in the hospital, organizational ethics decisions have to be based on reasons evidence that is considered relevant to the problem it's trying to solve. That sounds quite obvious, but you'd be surprised at how many scenarios uh, where arguments for why we should do something actually aren't tied to the, to the problem itself. The second condition is transparency. So you cannot have a fair process unless the all aspects of the process are are tra fully transparent and available to all. And that speaks to being able to maintain integrity as the earlier question uh, was asked. The third condition is you need some sort of mechanism to reconsider your prior decision based on new evidence. This sometimes looks like an appeals process or, or a, a, an opportunity for somebody to say, I disagree with that decision because not just because my values are different, but because I don't think you considered this body of relevant evidence. And that relevant evidence is often uh, evidence after you've implemented the decision. So you implement a decision and you wait and see what happens. And the outcome of the decision isn't what you thought it was going to be. And that becomes evidence to revisit the decision you made in the first place. The fourth condition is, is the one that by definition uh, requires uh, patient and family engagement. And, and it is a, an engagement condition that requires all stakeholders have to be formally engaged in some means. Now, this doesn't mean that every stakeholder gets a vote in the outcome of the decision, but there has to be a, a true and honest sense of engagement. And when it comes to patient and family partners in Ontario, we refer to uh, an, the Ontario Provincial Framework for Patient and Family Engagement. The fifth condition of a fair process is an enforcement condition. This is 
a condition that requires that there are mechanisms to ensure that those first four conditions are met. And that only exists because of how hard it is. You know, we can develop these, these conditions or these, these, uh, th th this process, this fair process idea. And this was uh, an academic product. This was a philosopher's idea to begin with. But putting it into practice is so challenging that you need some sort of uh, referee system to hold the decision-making process accountable to its own uh, conditions of fair process. So I, I feel like I've been talking for probably longer than uh, you had initially wanted me to. And I hope I didn't get like a, too esoteric. I mean, the idea was really to, to let you in on uh, some of the A problems, but B, the way that, that I and the hospital have to think through uh, making decisions in, in, uh, in an organizational ethics context. And hopefully I was able to demonstrate for you why the role of patient and family voice is so critical to just being able to justify uh, that we have made an ethical decision. So with that, I'll just kind of pause and see um, if there are questions, comments, or... Uh, I, I have a question for you, Robert. Um, how are you currently dealing? Well, I, I mean, patient, patients are allowed visitors now, but during the first six to eight months of COVID, many, many loved ones were dying and their family were not allowed to visit them because of restrictions imposed at the time they thought they were necessary. But how did your how did your group revisit these policies as time went on, especially as it related to the ability to, to, to have last moments with uh, loved ones? Yeah, so we actually had a, we realized early on that there was going to be a need for revisiting this question regularly. And so we had a, a working group that included risk management, privacy, some clinical leaders, and, and a, a handful of patient partners um, and we met on a weekly basis for a number of months to ask these very, these very questions. So as a fundamental principle, we did not want any patients to die alone. And so there were always, at every step of the way, exceptions made to the, the policy that was communicated broadly, because there were always going to be uh, unanticipated uh, circumstance. And that included when the, the, the loved one or the, the, the visitor of a dying patient was COVID positive themselves. Uh, you know, we made exceptions and put all sorts of contingencies in place that uh, it, it, it became such a, a kind of a, a web of rules that everything that we would communicate publicly and even the, the way the policy is written, it's, it's written as a simplistic policy, but then it allows for exceptions to be made. So it was a very difficult uh, uh, decision to have to restrict access in any way, but, but no patient was ever disallowed uh, a family member, uh, especially a dying, sorry, no dying patient was ever told they could have nobody with them. Now, I'll be absolutely honest. Were there some patients who died without uh, family and friends here? Uh, yes, just like in non-COVID times, uh, there are many patients whose family members aren't close by. Uh, there are homeless patients uh, who don't have loved ones. Um, it, it, it is always sad, and, and that is why our, our nursing care spends so much time with those patients. Um, but it continues to be, I mean, to this day, I, I told you right before this call, I was having this discussion about how are we going to, during wave four, uh, wrestle with this problem. And, and it's, it's not an easy, you know, again, to, to my very first point, people ask their colleagues, their friends, they ask other hospitals, and they ask the lawyers, and then they come back and they say, okay, great, we got all sorts of advice, still don't know what to do. I, I have a question, if I may, uh, to probably twofold. You, you said there were five steps in, in your process, and I was wondering who the adjudicators are for that, or the referees, and the time that it takes to 
execute the process. So th those conditions of fairness aren't mine. Uh, they actually come from uh, two philosophers, uh, Norm Daniels and, uh, and uh, Phil Sabin. Uh, it, it, the process is roughly called accountability for reasonableness. That's, that's literature you could look up. We're, we have to hold ourselves accountable. Um, and, and it's not a perfectly linear process. So that framework can be used proactively, but it, it's often used retrospectively to grade yourself on, on a fair process. So, you know, I, in some ways I would like to say it is part of my job it, as the director for the Department of Ethics to constantly hold the mirror up for the organization to say, this is where I think you're doing a good job and this is where I think you're failing. Um, it, it is very difficult to do, in particular, when you're under uh, great stress. So, you know, at a time like during COVID, most of the hospital operated on an, an emergency preparedness uh, framework. Like, like, you know, our traditional structures, our traditional committees, they were all thrown out the window. And you have an incident command structure, which doesn't always allow for the time of process uh, for the conditions that, that I that I outlined. And, and and so ethics is, you know, it should never be seen as a nice to have. It, ethics is always fundamental, but the, to give the time necessary to ethics to be able to justify to everyone else that you have followed good process, it, it is a very sad reality that uh, when times get as hard as they are, it becomes uh, more and more of a pressure on our ability to do that. And so I'll just give you one example. Right now, we have two competing problems. One, we are uh, short of our pool of nurses. We're, we're looking to hire nurses left, right, and center. Um, we have nurses leaving the profession. We have nurses leaving our organization to go to other organizations. And, and that's all being compounded by COVID. You know, the stress, the cumulative stress of, of working during a COVID environment, the stress of feeling I may be compelled to get a, a, a COVID vaccine in one hospital where I wouldn't in another. So we've got this pressure on, we're struggling to maintain staff, but the other pressure is uh, we need to get through a huge backlog of, of surgical uh, procedures. And, you know, those things are competing with one another. So if I, if I totally loosen my standards around the ethics of, you know, what I think uh, a good nurse should be, then I'll be able to, to do more surgical procedures. But if I really clamp down on, you know, th th that, that is a nurse who uh, has had some uh, performance issues, who really ought not to, you know, doesn't stand for the values uh, of LHSC actually, uh, it's, I, and I apologize for constantly referring to COVID scenarios, but this is my life right now. Um, a year and a half ago, some of you may have seen, there was a nurse who was an anti-vaccination uh, protester uh, leading rallies in downtown London. Uh, you know, the hospital had to ask itself, you know, does this correspond with the values of the organization and the values we want to represent us? But, but to, to let that nurse go makes it more difficult for us to um, be able to, to, to kind of address all of our, uh, our patient care needs. So, I mean, that is ethics in a nutshell. It is, it's never about easy, good versus bad. It's bad versus bad questions, right? It's always about the lesser of evils. And so uh, I, I, we're constantly weighing difficult decision against difficult decision. Thanks. Yes. How are you, sir? Yes, I am. Okay, good. Um, Robert, I just want to say that I, I first met you virtually doing a presentation to the local uh, Alzheimer's Society chapter uh, about three, four years ago. And you were talking to us about MAID, Medical Assistance in Dying. And I left that with... Uh, two major feelings. One um, is the very clear and professional way that you presented 
made for many of us, it was our first, first explanation. So you did a wonderful job in presenting it. And secondly, with the honesty in what you did, you did not shade over the difficult portions, particularly as it relates to people with dementia. At that time, we had no access to medical assistance in dying at all, according to the way the law was established at that time. And you made it clear, very kindly, but you made it clear and very professionally. I was so much impressed with your presentation. So I'm pleased that you're continuing employment within uh, LHSC. But here it is. I lay out the hard part. You want to, I'll give you a case example. I'm, and it deals with how do we go to the next step? Do we have any means of appeal? And this is uh, a medical assistance in dying issue. Over the weekend, it was made public in Ottawa about a young woman. She's 22 years of age. She's been suffering from some very different kind of, of uh, medical issue. There's no question about the fact that she has that issue. But the problem was she wanted to have medical assistance in dying. She's of legal age to ask it. Her parents who cared for her all this time, they agree and support her decision, but it was turned down. And the best that they can provide right now is palliative care and she's voluntarily starving and drinking herself, not drinking, to death. The SED, they call it. Now, if I were a parent, I had direct involvement. Could I initiate some kind of appeal for that non-decision? So um, I do remember you, Ron, and uh, thank you for the, uh, the nice words. What I, I'm unfamiliar with the case you're referencing, um, and what I don't know, and perhaps you could just quickly let me know, is, was this a legal decision or was this um, an individual clinician's assessment that this patient wasn't eligible? It was a medical decision of an individual oh, okay, so, so, uh, made assessor. Yeah, so, so, so uh, in Ontario, uh, you're always welcome. I mean, it is no different than uh, I got a, an opinion about whether I required surgery on my hip. Uh, I'm entitled to a second opinion. And so that patient and uh, her parents can seek out other physicians who have a different perspective uh, on her clinical eligibility. So uh, th that is something that is available to them today if it wasn't a, a legal decision. We, we're fortunate here with LHHC, uh, Judy Campbell, who's been coordinating all of this, is doing an excellent job, just a superb job. And I know that if somebody had a similar problem here in this district, I could refer them to Judy and she'd make sure that she'd make that person aware of other practitioners that could make an assessment of it. But those facts aren't generally known, Robert. There are a lot of people. Anyway, I'll just leave that with you. Ron, Ron and I think that I read about that case, and I think it's a young lady who has a, a disease where she has excruciating pain. That's right. That it, that's not able, that they're not able to deal with with normal uh, pharmaceuticals in that. And this, this is why her life is, uh, is completely and totally an agony. And, uh, and I, think, uh, I think maybe uh, as, as, as just suggested, she should be seeking other opinions. Right now she's dying in a palliative care ward because that's what the doctors have determined is the best way for her to go. Are there anyway. any, any other questions? Just a, a quick one to, to Robert. Um, you, you talked about, you know, you got to know what is before you can determine what, what ought. And I just want to comment in, uh, in emergency medicine where they have to make quick decisions and they often have to make decisions based on partial information. Is there a special challenge for uh, medical staff in, in emergency rooms, especially if there's uh, a uh, multiple vehicle accident and, and more than one more than one patient facing them, you know, triage and all that kind of stuff. If you want to comment on medical ethics in, in an emergency or, or an urgent situation. 
Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, the, the, there is a whole field of, uh, of case law around emergency medicine, which really becomes the guiding force uh, for ethics. You know, the, the principle is generally going to be um, you, you save a life first and you ask questions later. Now, that principle has been challenged in, in recent years where, um, you know, prior to assisted dying, and funny that we were just talking about it, it was never considered a rational choice to, to uh, want, for, to aspire to a death. And so uh, a, 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 an ethics case I give the med students every year is a, a patient who comes into the emergency department after having jumped off a, a 10 story building, but they have a note affixed to their chest that describes that, that this is a pre existing wish um, and, and describes in detail what their, their wishes are. That really challenges. Uh, the way that the the case law would work, but in general, uh, it, it is you start from a, a presupposition of we're going to save a life first and ask questions later. Now, certainly, uh, some of the exceptions include if I find a, a Jehovah's Witness card, or you know, if I have evidence that this patient would not want something that I'm about to do, I I cannot reasonably do something that I think they would not want, and of course, we're always from the minute somebody comes to the hospital, we start tracking down families so we can corroborate, make sure we're making the best decisions possible. Um, it, it even happens with palliating patients that sometimes they're on a home palliative plan and sometimes home palliation doesn't work as, as it should. And in a frightened moment, a loved one might call an ambulance um, not because they want us to do a heroic rescue, but because they don't know how to deal with the situation they're presented with. And the law in Ontario requires that ambulance drivers, uh, there is only one very special piece of paper that allows them not to intervene to their fullest. And so sometimes patients end up here and, uh, and we don't realize that in fact, they're on this longer palliative trajectory, but. So, so, you know, yes, uh, emergency medicine is kind of got a, a different set of operating rules that, uh, that, that we're well accustomed to. I mean, what, one of the things that I say about urgent ethics consultation, um, my team, you know, we carry a pager 24 seven, but we, we only communicate that we answer the pager from seven to seven, Monday to Friday. Because if you need an urgent ethics consult, we are the last people you want to talk to. Uh, our job is to slow the process of decision making down, to ask lots of questions that people don't like hearing from. Uh, we really uh, just put, a, put a, a whole bunch of brakes on the system. Uh, you, we tell people if it's three in the morning, you trust your clinical judgment. And if it's a problem at seven the next morning, then we'll have a conversation. Yeah, you're the you're the uh, Senate of ethics, the sober second thought. That, that's the idea. Wonderful, Robert. It has been an incredibly interesting presentation. Um, I know many of us started thinking more about the ethics of healthcare over the last year, year and a half because of COVID. Um, you have now reinforced the complexity of the decisions involved and a, the difficulty of making an ethical decision. Uh, very infor informative, very educational presentation today. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Rotary Club of London, uh, we would like to recognize your presentation today with a contribution to the Polio Plus campaign of the Rotary Foundation. And in your name, we will be immunizing 50 infants against polio. Because of you, Rotary is one step closer to a polio-free world. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. So we will start with some club announcements. Steve Knox, membership. Uh, yes, so we have a new membership application um, that's been received for, from the Satellite Club. Um, and the application has been received by, uh, the name of the person is Sahar El-Khatob. 
who's a lawyer at Learners, uh, and the sponsor is Heather McDonald. Um, there's a little note here that uh, I believe it's um, Sahar's mother is the is a member of the Rotary Club of Global Passport and former member of the uh, Lambeth Club. Um, the other announcement is we have a transfer. Um, Kirk Langford um, has advised us that he is being transferring to the Rory Club of Strathroy. Uh, so we, we will miss him, but he is still very active in the district. So I, I suspect we will hear from him uh, in the years to come. So uh, we, we will miss him certainly in our, our, our uh, satellite club, uh, but he will be an addition to the uh, Strathroy Club. Thank you, Steve. Heather. Hello, everyone. Um, I've been putzing away here on messages back and forth. We have, for the golf tournament, definite um, 15 teams. I am waiting on two more, so we could have upwards of uh, 17 in total. Still happy to take registrations. Um, we've had a few more auction items trickle in. We are still looking for more. We are quite light this year, but John will give you more details on that. Dinner only is available, and I will be emailing out to our uh, volunteers, et cetera, to find out who all is staying for dinner. But if you are not golfing, you'd like to come out and join us. We are in an outdoor covered space for dinner. So um, hopefully you'll feel some comfort with that, that we're kind of in an open air, but uh, covered from any elements we may have. And I figure it's only gonna be sunshine at this point. We've always had really good weather. So why would this year be any different? Uh, so if you'd like to come out and join us or have your spouse uh, join us at the end of the day, happy to have you. Um, if you have any other questions, you know, you can email me at this point, but uh, just would like to boost up some of our auction items. So touch base with your dentist, your chiropractor, your massage therapist, uh, your local drugstore, your favorite hairdresser, see what you can scrounge up for us and uh, see what we can make this a really big financial success here this year. Thanks. Yeah, I don't, uh, it's John. I don't have much to add <clears throat> from Heather. Uh, with those extra ones, I think we're getting up around 12 to 15 uh, donations at this point. So uh, the more the merrier. And uh, if you have anything that you uh, want to send my way, give me an email and um, make arrangements to either pick it up or you can just bring it to the golf tournament. And the East Coast Kitchen Party, we still don't have all the details yet. I just kind of reserved that date Friday, October the 8th. Keep that on your calendar. And then Rick, quick update on Environment Day. Uh, yes, um, I've uh, received good response on the registration. So we have more than enough people now to uh, plant the trees. I will be following up with uh, some of the people that registered uh, to talk about the, the, the bringing their, their young families out and stuff and uh, who, who, what and how, where and what ages and things like that, just to clarify who's going to be able to plant the trees. Uh, but uh, it's a go right now for Saturday, October the 2nd, and I will be uh, following up with Keith Morrow in our club to get a check for 50% of the, uh, and then I'll also be in touch with Dave Wells for the other 50% of the cost. So I'll be doing that in the next week. Um, before we close the meeting, I just want to remind everyone of our rot Rotary motto for this year, which is serve to change lives. Now, a few reminders about the upcoming weeks. Tomorrow night, we will have cocktail hour once again at 5 p.m. Coffee clutches Thursday at 10.30 a.m. Uh, the Satellite Club will have a special speaker in next week, next Tuesday night, to talk about human trafficking. And because we do not have a meeting next Monday because of later Labor Day, I uh, invite everyone to attend the Satellite Club meeting on Tuesday night. Um, I will arrange to get the Zoom details sent out to everyone so that if you are interested in attending that meeting and listening to their speak on human trafficking, you will be able to. And one more formality is we will have our club board meeting Wednesday, September 15th at 5 p.m. once again on Zoom. Thank you, everyone. Have a good week.